John Nichols has made a life writing books and taking pictures in his beloved New Mexico. And of course, Nichols broke through years ago with his novel, The Milagro Bean Field War. It's become a staple of literature classes across the country. His latest offering, On Top of Spoon Mountain, is a novel about a man in a similar stage of life as Nichols. But as NMAF producer Matt Grubbs found out, it's no thinly veiled autobiography. John Nichols, thanks for coming in. We'll start with On Top of Spoon Mountain. Um, what gave rise to this book? What was in your head um, when you decided this is something I want to write about? What was in my head when I started writing about it? Probably nothing. <laughs> it's like I started trying to write a really, really big book um, that incorporated everything but the kitchen sink. And, and um, I began writing it in 2000 and wrote about 1,300 pages, a 1,400 page first draft. And I wasn't really thinking very straight. And what I was trying to do was to write about how convoluted and complicated and impossible one modern day life is. Two, how we're destroying the planet. Three, how climate change is changing everything, you know. Four, how climax capitalism is uh, basically wrecking, you know, the planet's economy and all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to do it by showing the life of a single individual uh, just going to um, hell in a handbasket. And obviously I didn't have a real good plan, except that I knew at the very end of the book that this guy would try and climb a mountain to get back to his human origins. The main character, Jonathan Kepler, Kepler. Um, he seems to be somewhat self-aware. I mean, he, even as he sort of maybe veers into the ridiculous, he, he knows that that's where he's going. Is that planned? And is there an element of that that it's just sort of self-fulfilling? Like we may, we may be self-aware, but we can't keep ourselves from being ourselves. We're just going to do what we've always done. Duh. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, humanity, we know that we're destroying the planet. We know that growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. We know that if we keep on building more cars, if China keeps on building more cars, you know, if the world keeps proceeding at the rate we're proceeding, that we're going to self-destruct. I mean, if you're sitting there smoking four packs of cigarettes a day, you know. I mean, there is evidence from, from, uh, from various scientists, you know, in the U.S. government, and the little warning on the packets that if you smoke four packs of cigarettes a day, you're doomed, right? <laughs> Something bad is going to happen. So, yeah, we're all aware. I mean, every time we get into our um, 2012 SUVs, right? And, turn on the ignition switch and drive to the station to go to work, right? We know that this particular lifestyle isn't really going to last forever without enormous consequences, right? So, so yeah, I'm, I'm imbuing my character with maybe a little more self-awareness than you'd like. But, yeah, he understands how he screwed up his life. He understands how, how the world around him is screwed up. He understands what's happening to the world that he lives in. And despite the fact that we know, that most of us know, that the planet knows, uh, the human community knows what we're doing to ourselves and to the earth, we just, we keep doing it. It's really, really hard to disengage and figure out another way to do it. So Kepler is, is 65, right, in, in the novel? No, he's going to be 65. Oh, okay. At the, in the, the last pages of the novel. Oh, that's right. He's 64. 64. <coughs> and so, 300. So you started this in 2000. And, right. And at that time, you're just getting into your 60s, mm -hmm. and you're, you're looking forward at this guy. By the time you finish, you, you've passed him up. Um, did his age and his perspective on life, did that kind of grow as you got older or did you kind of come up on him and then pass him by no no it's like i mean 
Everyone will say, this is autobiographical novel, and Jonathan Kepler is just like you, right? The fact of the matter is that for the last 40 years, I've climbed those mountains relentlessly, you know, day and night. It's like I never fell off the wagon and got out of shape or whatever. I mean, I've fished the Rio Grande Gorge for 40 years, you know, going down steep bajadas and over boulders to do it. And I've climbed in the in the high mountains, you know, up to 13,000 feet regularly since, since I was in my mid-50s. And uh, so I was never pining to climb a mountain when I, on my 65th birthday uh, because I was climbing, you know, high mountains. The day before like, your 65th. The day before, <laughs> my, and, and a week before, and two weeks before, and sure, a month before. Sure. I mean, uh, actually, from the age of 60 on, I went nuts and, and, and spent maybe two or three days a week up in the tundra, you know, above 12,000 feet. And um, I have two million photographs and, and, and incredible field notes about that. So, so I sort of invented Jonathan Kepler's dilemma. Okay. Right? And in that, in that respect, this guy is a lot different than, than I was during the writing of the book. I was just trying to figure out how to write a book. <laughs> you know? I wasn't trying to figure out how to climb the mountain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that part you knew. Yeah, I knew that part. What do you get out of being up there in the tundra and uh, up by Williams Lake and Wheeler Peak and What do I Lobo get out Peak? of it? Yeah. What does it bring oh, you? Oh, it just it brings me a euphoria. It, it's, um, first of all, it's an area that other people don't go to very much. They go to Wheeler Peak. Wheeler Peak is the tallest mountain in New Mexico, so it's a magnet. And um, everybody that climbs up to Williams Lake from the Towski Valley, and there may be 200 of them a day that do that, right? They all get sucked onto Wheeler Peak because that's the mythological peak, right? If you take one step west, toward Lake Fork Peak or Spoon Mountain or Sentinel Crag or Catherine Overlook or any of any of the hills in that basin. It's a relatively limited basin. You meet nobody. <laughs> and I spent about eight years just climbing around that basin, avoiding Wheeler Peak. Um, like eight or nine years, maybe I met six people. Six people. <laughs> um, in all those years. I just learned where I could go, there's no trails, and where I could be alone, and where I could really observe everything from the weather to, I became a fanatic for bighorn sheep, you know, I carried a spotting scope, it's real interesting. I read a lot of books, I befriended the, the bighorn biologists in New Mexico, you know. But I also observed all the migratory birds, the wildlife, I learned the botany, so my shtick has always been in my father's, my grandfather's, is simply to be really, really um, aware of the web of life that sustains us and how we fit into it. Um, and that should lead, theoretically, right, to leading a life that makes way less of a carbon imprint on the planet, you know. Those themes seem to run throughout a number of your books. Have you found, as, as you've been writing for the last half century, that um, your themes have changed, or you, do you keep circling back to familiar territory intentionally or unintentionally? No, I mean, you know, they say every writer keeps writing the same, rewriting the same story, yeah. right? You just, and uh, there's also a shibboleth that there's only five stories on earth, and everybody keeps rewriting them, you know? And, and uh, so obviously there's um, a lot. Um, in this book, on top of Spoon Mountain, that you could find, and at least you could find it in from Milagro Beanfield War on, you know, all the time that I've lived in New Mexico. Sure, they always um, they, they they everyone who knows about writing. <laughs> you people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm in college. I'm sitting in a um, a creative writing class, and my professor says, "Write what you know." Mm -hmm. And when we when we last saw John Nichols in our Artisodes episode. Right. Um, you talked about writing about what you're interested in. Yeah. Do you, are you aware of where those two points intersect, where you're kind of interested in one thing, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I, I know plenty about this. I can write about it. 
Yeah, it's also, if you don't know anything about it, you can write about it. I mean, that's why God gave you an imagination. I mean, to write what you know, yeah, that's, a, that's good advice, right? But two is, um, you know, write, write about what you don't know, too. Try and imagine it, learn about it, research it, whatever. Um, uh, you don't tell an actor um, uh, that's going to play and the postman always rings twice, you know, that you have to have been in a plot with your mistress to kill her husband or whatever in order to play the part. You don't have to be a murderer in order to play the part of a murderer, you know, and you don't have to be a mountain climber to write about mountain climbing. I mean, that's, that's, that's my theory, and I'm, I'm sure. So, so, yeah, it's good advice to write what you know, but, but, but on, on the second hand, it's real good advice to use your imagination, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Maurice Sendak didn't run around in the jungle, you know, and talk to <laughs> lions and tigers and weird alien furry creatures, you know, in oh, order to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, use your imagination. Sure, too, sure. too, also. Society seems fascinated with like the J.D. Salingers and the Harper Lees, these people who write this great book and then they're mm -hmm. like, I'm done, you know, I'm done yeah. with it. And that certainly hasn't been you, you've kept writing, but, but you said to us that you didn't want to write, you know, Abbott and Costello meet the Milagro Beanfield no. War or the Milagro Beanfield War and the Goblet of Fire or uh -huh. whatever it is. <laughs> right. um, is, that, is that conscious? Would you feel like a sellout if you had, if you had kept doing that? No, it's just my shtick. You know, I mean, I sort of feel that, that, how do I feel? I feel sort of like, okay, everything I write during a lifetime will just all fit into a, a single, single frame, a single ball. And that, okay, you write the Milagro Beanfield War, you write the Sterile Cuckoo, you write the Magic Journey, you write American Blood, you write An Elegy for September, you write Conjugal Bliss, and these books move around. But they're all just parts of things that interest me, you know, that obviously are triggered by my own life story or by everything else that I read. And that, um, you don't need to just keep, you try not to keep re-saying the same book every time you figure out, okay, I, I wrote a book about growing beans, now I'm going to write a book about catching fish, you know, and I, <laughs> then I'm going to write a book about climbing mountains, you know, then I'm going to write a book about how marriage sucks, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And, but it, it's all part of experience that has interested me, and in the end, all the books together will be some kind of a whole. And they'll all be related to each other because it's just me doing it. You know, it's my personality, obnoxious, whatever, plodding <laughs> along every But they'll all fit into just a single picture or whatever. It's good to know there's more to come. Dad, yeah, there's always more to come. I mean, what, what else are you going to do? <laughs> right? John Nichols, thanks so much for coming in. We appreciate it. Thank you.